Arkansas. And now, No Cap Sports brings to you NFL division previews. We're going to get you ready for the NFL season. We're going to go through all 32 teams in the league, division by division. And today, up first, we got the NFC East. The sorriest division in the NFL? Maybe. So, let's start out with the worst team and the worst division, the Philadelphia Eagles. Looking at the team last year, that was 4-11-1. and one. Last in the division, like I said, they had a lot of troubles offensively, starting with the big-name guy in Carson Wentz, guy who got benched in uh, the second half of a Week 13 game in favor of Jalen Hurts. But I don't think it would be fair to put all the Phillies' offensive struggles on Carson Wentz. You got to look at their offensive line. Uh, offensive line in which seven guys total were on IR or missed time throughout the year, and they gave up 65 sacks on the season. And then they also faced a lot of injuries in that receiver room with uh, Alshon Jeffrey and uh, Deshaun Jackson missing a lot of time, as well as rookie receiver Jalen Rager. So looking at this team, the defense was middle of the pack. Uh, and in the year, they didn't make the playoffs. Of course, Doug Peterson was let go, and he was replaced by Nick Sirianni, the coach, offensive coordinator, for three years under Frank Wright, who was Philadelphia's old offensive coordinator. And so coming into the offseason, the Eagles have made some significant moves, bringing in an edge rusher and Ryan Kerrigan, uh, showing up the defensive back unit with Anthony Hirsch, Steven Nelson. And they also, like I said, they made some they had some significant losses this offseason, including losing, you know, their quarterback, Carson Wentz, giving the keys to Jalen Hurts. So looking at this team, how do you guys feel about their offseason and how they're situated for this upcoming season? Um, you know. I, they, I, they made the right moves, but I don't think it'll be enough. You know, obviously they took the having the trophy winner Devontae Smith at ten. You know, just to give that offense just a little bit of rebuke because, like you talked about, Nick, when you got when well, you did talk about it, but you got guys like Travis Fulcom and Greg Ward as your main, you know, receiving threats. You know, whoever's at quarterback, he's gonna he's gonna be struggling a, a little bit. So you know, unfortunately, he actually you know had a tour MCL. He's down with two to three weeks. But outside of that, you know, I really don't think they really added enough of receivers at, you know, at that position to really give Carson Wentz a little bit more juice. You talked about Jeffries and, you know, talked about Deshaun Jackson, you know, moving on. And they were hurt for a lot of last season. So if they're going to make it work, these guys that they had within their system, within, within the, the team already are going to have to take, you know, wide strides. You know, Rager was hurt a lot last year. But even when he was on the field, he wasn't as, you know, as productive as, as you would have hoped for a first-round pick. So hopefully he can take another big step. But I think they're – very reliant, honestly, on Devontae Smith coming in and being that number one guy and that guy that, you know, can consistently, you know, create mismatches that, you know, for the number one corner, which is, you know, as a productive as a season he had at Alabama, that's a lot to ask for a, a rookie and even a first rounder. So personally, I think that, you know, even before you, you talk about getting the ball outside of your guys, you know, the offensive line will have a lot to do with it. You know, you talked about Brandon Bush missing the entire season, Lane Johnson, you know, only playing seven games. This is a team that had, a NFL record, 14 different offensive line combinations within 16 games. So you're bringing back essentially two pro bowlers. I think that will be able to do a lot more for the offense, you know, in terms of, you know, protecting uh, protecting win, protect, uh, protecting Jalen Hurts and anything else. So I think that will open up the holes for, uh, you know, Miles Sanders. He, he, he's taking some big steps. I think he has a 1,000 yards running all over him. You know, a guy that we're pretty familiar with, Kenneth game well. You know, they have, you know – I think I, I don't think as out of line to say they, they're probably going to be the worst team in the division still, but they've taken some steps in the right direction. I'll say that. What about you, Vance? I agree with you. Uh, you know, first of all, shout out Jannard Avery out of Je Grenada, Mississippi. You know, <laughs> um, you know, they they showed up a little bit of the the, the secondary with uh, Anthony Harris. You know, one of the most underrated guys in the league. Pairing somebody opposite of Darius Slay that they can get out of it. And then, you know, Darius Slay in his first year with Philadelphia, he wasn't the best, wasn't the guy that, you know, you got, you thought you were the pro bowler that you thought you were going to get coming out of Detroit. But give him a, giving him a second year, give him another year to get comfortable in this, this circumstance. And like I said, with Anthony Harris being back there, you know, I think, you know, it takes guys a year or two, you know, these are professional athletes, but giving them a year or two in the system to get more comfortable and things like that. So, you know, they've taken so many steps. My biggest thing for me, um, pass rush. You know, you talked about Ryan Kerrigan. You know, he would have been great in 2016. I don't know how much how much of a, a, a dynamic pass rush he'll average this year. But you go, Brandon Graham is 33 years old. He's been probably their best pass rusher for the past two to three years. And you know, he Derek was a Barnett, Pro Bowler last year, first time Pro Bowler I mean, last year. Yeah, but again, he's not getting any younger. So I definitely. 
definitely think he's more of a an interior pass rusher, somebody that's not going to, you know, really just – not somebody that OC is not going to be worried about your tackles on at the edge. And that's my biggest concern for them. You know, you got Josh Sweat. You got a, you got a lot of guys that sound good in theory, but, you know, on the field I don't think would be one of the biggest opponents. You know, Derek Barnett hasn't really lived, lived up to his expectations since being drafted in the first round in 2014. You know, the, the inside is, is secure. You got Javon Hargrave, you got Fletcher Cox. But in terms of guys that are going to provide edge pressure, I think that that's probably one of the biggest holes that, you know, Philadelphia is missing. And with, you know, the passing game being dominating the NFL like it is today, that's, that's going to be a serious problem for them. So they're going to be really relying on getting pressure from B-gap to B-gap because I don't think they have the guys on the, on out, at the C-gaps and the tackles to really generate consistent pass. Rate. That's crazy because you don't, you don't like Barnett? Derek Barnett out of Tennessee, you not you don't like him? No, you know, he hasn't had more than five sacks in a year, bro. Mm. Unless he has a, a stupid jump, or oh, he got way more athletic this year than he was last year, and I don't really see him making anything shake. I mean, that well, that was the only good thing I had to say about the Eagles. You know, when you think about the Eagles, they're like a brothel, bro. There's so many hoes. <laughs> I mean, but anyways, the defense is just—it just has so many holes in it. Really, it's just, when you think about it, the corners, food is no. You got Darius Slay, Avante Maddox. Avante Maddox was a fourth rounder, bro. That that that's the best. That was the best person that they got. Then they got another fourth rounder out of Texas Tech, Zach McPherson. Texas Tech probably the worst power five defense in college football year <laughs> after year. You know you're gonna score fifty points against Texas Tech, so no, I, I'm I'm not liking that either. Then they're just never healthy, bro. It's just especially last season the O line, and then uh, going into this uh, preseason, they got two guys, uh, two guards, offensive guards. Both of their guards are injured right now, and Devontae Smith he already has a knee sprain. You think you think his uh, frame can hold up? And that was the big question, you know, Slim Reaper. But yeah, regardless of how much we think he can succeed, 165 to 175 pounds is still very light for a player. So, I mean, hopefully he doesn't continue to, to tradition, but he's not off to a good start in terms of being healthy. So, you know, honestly, <laughs> outside of Devontae Smith, I think the, the most reliable uh, passing game option they'll have is Dallas Goddard. And that's not really yeah. too dynamic of a guy that you want to have, you know, as your number one. I mean, I'm glad you brought up Dallas Goddard. That's a guy who had 46 catches, 524 yards, three tutties last year. And I can see him having a bigger role in the offense this year, especially with all the offseason speculation about Zach Ertz. You know, he said he wants out of Philadelphia, especially coming off a year in 2019 where he had 88 catches, 916 yards, six tutties, and didn't get the contract extension he was looking for. So he comes back this year, 2020, plays 11 games, only has 335 yards, and Dallas Goddard kind of started to take over the tight end room for Zach Ertz because of his injury problems. So do you guys think Zach Ertz and Goddard will be on the Eagles this year, or do you think Ertz will end up getting traded or getting sent out? Mm, traded or sent out, I would just have to determine that actual outcome. Like, what value does he have for another team? You know, a, a an older tight end on the wrong side of 30 that doesn't, you know, have he, – he's not, he's not going to be a guy that you can do like Jimmy Graham and spit him in the slot and create mismatch problems like that. He's more of an inline Jack guy. Is younger than Jimmy Graham. I'm, but he's not as fast as Jimmy Graham. He's not as dynamic as Jimmy Graham. But I'm, like, in terms of, like, red zone stuff, he's not a guy that you're going to, you know, where people are debating about Jimmy Graham being paid as a receiver or tight end. That's because he took so many snaps in the slot or took so many snaps even outside. That's not Zach Ertz. So, Dallas Goddard is probably – the probably covers about 80% of the production that uh, Zach Ertz, he's probably not going to ever get to that, you know, uh, 80, 85, 90, 90 uh, catch season, 1,000 yard season like Zach Ertz did. But, I mean, as, that seems to be the one position that Philadelphia has no problem about. So, if Dallas Goddard can take that next step and come like 50 guy, 50, 50 catch guy for 600 yards, it'll be really redundant to have both of them in tight end room. I well, think it will actually work in their favor to keep uh, both tight ends, especially just for Jalen Hurts. If it, if it, if I was the offense coordinator, I would just flat out have uh, Jalen Hurts run Alabama's offense when he was at Alabama. You know, keep everything yeah. in between the hash lines, not not spread out the offense a little bit too much. And I think that worked best for him, especially when you have running backs like uh, Miles Sanders and Boston Scott. Yeah, but I will say one thing, though. She got Zach Hurts messed up, bro. Like way messed up. For one, for one, he's only thirty, bro. He's only thirty. And for two, twenty eighteen, 
he had a thousand yard season with 116 catches. He he was a he was an elite tight end. He I don't know. Not, I don't understand how he was him. comes into that. He's 30. He's only 30. That's okay. good in NFL years. Okay. So okay. I, my personal belief, especially with the year that he had last year, Dallas got it kind of a, a team that we'll talk about later. Uh, Dalton Schwartz, a guy that's kind of on a similar trajectory. He's, oh, he's he's younger. He's he's a little bit more experienced. Not a more experienced. He's he got a little bit more juice to him on that tight end line. I think that you know Zach Ertz was an elite tight end. If he can have a, a bounce back year, and if you feel disrespected about the, the contract he didn't receive, I mean, it is what it is. That'll be good for Philadelphia. It'll probably take them from five wins to seven wins. I guess if that makes him feel good. But I mean, Dallas got is kind of the future. You know, he, he played well in a limited role. And if he get if he can take if he can takes a lot of Zach Ertz snaps and you know get you know starts eight, 10, 12 games, I guess I, I think it's well within the realm of possibility he gets to he gets to fifty five catches, he gets to six, seven, eight touchdowns, and I'm literally just gonna do the, the Patriots mode where they're gonna run a bunch of two tight end sets, which might not be that bad for them considering they only got one truly dynamic receiver. Now, I don't think it'll be worth it to sign both of them to big contracts when you're trying to develop. You know, two first rounders on the outside. But who do I know? But talking about that offense some more, the centerpiece of it all is Jalen Hurts. He got the keys handed to him this offseason when they traded Carson Wentz. Nate Sudfield uh, ended up signing with the 49ers, even though Sudfield came in and replaced Jalen Hurts in week 17. Looking at Jalen Hurts, how much faith do you have in Jalen Hurts to lead a winning team? Um, down the road a lot. This year, not so much. They made, I mean, he's he he'll be able to be protected at least on the right side with Lane Johnson and Brandon Brooks. But they gotta they gotta build a better infrastructure around them. They, I mean, they're starting in the right directions with uh, Smith and Rager. Um, I like the idea that actually Vance talked about having them both and kind of you know assimilating that Alabama offense to the Philadelphia Eagles because, like you said, he he is the franchise at this point. He's gonna be the guy that the the fans rise and fall with. So I think in the future, I think that he will be a really good option. He can be a potentially a Pro Bowl quarterback, and he can. I can see him being the best quarterback in the division sooner rather than later. But at this very moment, I don't really see a lot of success coming from him until he until he gets some more pieces around him. It is what it is. It, 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 no. Yeah, the the better Jalen Hurts' quarter uh, team is, the better he is. So uh, just looking at it, uh, his, his team's not that good in Philadelphia, but I, I think he can. He, he's good enough to get some wins. But it takes a special quarterback to take a team like this. Like, I don't even know if Aaron Rodgers could take this team to the playoffs, honestly. It, it, it'll be it'll be a, a reach. They might they might get in just because he's Aaron Rodgers, but it, it's a different level of quarterback that you need. But Jalen Hurts is good. He's just not on that superstar level yet. Yeah. And to your point, the better the team is, the better Jalen Hurts performed. Last year in three full starts, weeks 13, 14, and uh, 15, he went one and two with his one victory coming against the Saints, completed 55% of his passes, threw for about 282 yards a game, about two tutties, less than one interception, and about 7.34 yards per attempt. So as you can see, this is a dynamic dual threat guy, but I'm not exactly convinced he's a franchise guy yet, in all honesty. I mean, at this, at this point, I mean, no, I wouldn't say that just because he has a he he doesn't have a system around him. But you don't think with you know, you don't think with a, a true number one. Uh, if he, if he had a lot of the tools that they had with him uh, two years ago, you don't think he can be a, like a Pro Bowler, a guy that can lead your team playoffs? I mean, yes, I think he can become that eventually. But I'm I'm not a big fan of just putting it all essentially putting all the pressure on Jalen Hurts, and now he has even more pressure on his shoulders to be successful this season with Carson Wentz being injured. Because with Carson Wentz being injured, the second round pick that the Eagles received for him is likely going to remain the second round pick because Carson Wentz isn't going to play enough snaps for that pick to be turned into a first round pick for them. How good so, do y'all think Jalen Hurts is? Like, do y'all think he's a top half quarterback, bottom half? I think he's right in the middle. Somewhere in that middle room. I, I, I'll put him in top 10. Not this year, but give him I, two years, two, three years. Give me, give me top 10. Jeez, he already had a game where he, he had a, a, what, a, a 300-yard passing game with a 100 yards rushing against Arizona, I think. Like, the guy fits the the mold and has the, the, the tools I mean, to be a guy that's 
productive in this league a long time. Pro Bowl, also, things like that. But with this cast that he had in front of him, which is unfair to kind of cast, you know, all of this on a second round pick, he's not gonna he's not gonna be able to get it done this year or even but, next year. Uh, but just to your point, he's had his great moments and he's had his very bad moments. You look at that week seventeen game when he started against Washington. He went seven for twenty, seventy two yards, three point six yards per attempt and a pick, and he got pulled at halftime. So just like he has his highs, he's had his lows in this league. So like I said, I just feel like that's putting a lot of pressure on a young guy to carry your franchise. I I really think he's in the bottom half of like starting quarterbacks. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Teams that I'd rather have him than their own, than their other team's quarterback. Maybe five. But y'all think he could be top ten, top half? I do. I mean, I, is he right he now can, though? Right now, no, he's right now. But the things that he does, the way that he's seen in the field, you know, a lot of the things I feel like you can't teach in terms of physical tools, his ability to be comfortable in the pocket. Like he, he, he. he I, is he better than Carson Wentz right now? Definitely so. I would say that. I mean, I, I give you has one bad year. One bad year. And he's Bro, he's trash. He, he's done. He's hurt. Did, did y'all see that? Yeah, yeah, he messed his foot up. Oh, my goodness, bro. He's trash. He's made out of paper. <laughs> Can Jalen Hurts have an MVP type of year in him? Definitely so. If Carson went, yeah, I definitely think. He's a better team. That's what I'm saying. And I think that his ceiling is higher than Carson Wentz's, honestly. No. Okay. So, as we wrap this section up, where does Jalen Hurts rank right now among quarterbacks in the division? Looking at Dak, we're going to assume Ryan Fitzpatrick is the starter in Washington. Daniel Jones, Jalen Hurts rank those four quarterbacks in the division. I don't know. I like the bet high. I mean, he's black, so we got to go for him too. So I'll put Dak, Jalen, Jay, and Ryan Fitzpatrick. So second best, second best quarterback in the division right now. I'm not against saying that. Mm, I'm going to go Dak number one. Uh, number two and three is where it gets tricky. It's either between J- Jalen Hurts or, or Daniel Jones. Right now, I'm going to take, ooh. Yeah, yeah he, he is black. Jalen Hurts, number two. <laughs> Daniel Jones, number three. Ryan Fitzpatrick, number four. Why? But do not be fooled when Ryan Fitzpatrick looks like the best quarterback in the first eight weeks. He's going to fall off the cliff once they get tape on him. But he's number four. Okay. That's fine, man. So now we're going to go and flip the page, go to the next team in the division. And that's the New York Giants, man. They went 6-10 and 10 last year, second in the division, not good enough to make the playoffs, though. But they started the season 0-5 before winning in Washington. Now, just like the Eagles, this is a team that faced a lot of injury problems on offense, looking at Saquon only playing in two games before tearing his ACL. Daniel Jones missed three weeks, three games. And then the offense also took a hit. Overall, just without having Saquon Barkley, that's an all-pro guy, you know, a top five back in the league. And it just forced everybody to step their game up. You look at guys like Darius Slayton coming on and being the team's leading receiver with 751 yards. And Evan Ingram earning his first Pro Bowl nod with uh, 654 yards and 63 receptions. And now this was uh, head coach Joe Judge, his first year as a head coach. He was the Patriots special teams coordinator prior. And then you look at the defensive side of the ball. This is where this is why I think the Giants should have a lot to be excited for coming into 2020. They were the ninth in points allowed, only allowing 22.3 points per game. They were 12th in yards allowed, uh, allowing about 350 yards per game. And this defense created 40 sacks without a star edge rush. So there's obviously a lot of good schemes, a lot of good defense being played in New York. And all of that was highlighted in a week 13 win against the Seahawks in Seattle without Daniel Jones, the game they won 17 to 12, holding Russell Wilson and that Seahawks offense to 12 points. So now, as always, you know, looking at this Giants team, how do y'all feel about them coming into 2020? Um, I picked them as my sleeper team, you know, way many episodes ago. You know, and I, I don't have to think about it. I think this actually is a pretty good blueprint, at least offensively, for the Eagles to follow in terms of surrounding, uh, you know, Jalen Hurst weapons. You already get you. You go out of free agency and get you an undisputed number one in Kenny Galladay, somebody that led the league in touchdowns two years ago, and just you know red zone threat. You know he 
kind of gives you a, a security blanket. So, to, you know, you know, guys like Slade and guys like Shepard that are going to operate in a slot, you know, Kenny Galladay, 6'4", 230. It, it, there's, there's only so much of him that you can cover, let's say like that. <laughs> but you got, you know, a solid foundation. You got two guys. I, I really like Sterling Shepard, Darius Slade in the slot that have, you know, essentially have been overperforming as ones. And now that you got like a true boundary guy, they can fill up more into, you know, receiver two and receiver three roles. And then you get in the draft and get, you know, one of the most, the most dynamic play, playmaker in my book, Kadarius Tony. You can put him in the slot. He's taking some running back reps. You know, Saquon's uh, injury history is kind of, you know, up and down. So w- whenever he inevitably misses some games this year, you know, Kadarius Tony can step in and take some of that load off his shoulders. So, I mean, this year is, is a make it break for not only Daniel Jones, but David Gettleman. You know, the team has been consistently trash since he's been there, 15 and 33. And, then, you know, this is the third year for Daniel Jones. He's no longer a, a rookie or sophomore quarterback. You know, this is the kind of – this is the year that I got written down. He's either going to become Josh Allen or Sam Darnold. And, you know, it hurts me to say that. But this is this, – this, this, it'll happen this year. You know, no, the, the pieces are in place for him to make it happen. And we'll, we'll have to see how truly of a quarterback he really is. I don't think there's any more excuses for him to not be at least a, you know, a Pro Bowl level guy. Okay, so I'm glad you brought up Daniel Jones. So are you a Daniel Jones believer, man? He was drafted sixth overall, the second quarterback taken in that 2019 draft behind Kyler Murray. The quarterbacks who were drafted after him were Dwayne Haskins, Drew Locke, and Will Greer. So how much faith do you have in Daniel Jones? Um, I can say, honestly, more than I had on draft night. Like you said, going at six, a lot, a lot of people, including myself, thought that was a huge reach. Um, didn't realize the, the amount of mobility he had outside of the pocket, although, you know, tripping himself up on sure touchdown runs don't help. But I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a Daniel Jones guy. You know, him be able to make plays outside of the pocket, for him to have kind of really been the, the, the cornerstone of this offense while Saquon was down, while Ray without a number one, you know, some questionable, not, you know, some inexperienced head coaches. You don't really usually become a special team guy to a head coach. I just think that he, he has grown into his roles. They, the, the Giants have put some offensive pieces around him. I think he, 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 he has a good arm. He can make, you know, good, really good throws, fit him in the tight windows. He's not one of these, uh, these guys that are going to have to dig and dunk his way to a high completion rate. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a DJ guy. I'll say that. He's not better than Jalen Hurts. But I, he, he, to have, for him to be the third best quarterback in this division, it speaks a lot to, you know, the future of the, this division. He's really in the same situation as Jalen Hurts. You know, last year they both dealt with uh, pitiful O-lines, piss poor O-lines. I think uh, that goes a lot into his inaccuracy as a quarterback. But I think I saw a lot of good things from him. If you can get him some protection, bro, I think he can get the job done. Now, they got him the weapons, you know, depending if Evan Ingram gets his uh, act right, bro, it stops dropping the football. But he has all the weapons he needs. Uh, If he can get some protection, uh, I think he would be – in the. I think he could be an upper half quarterback, actually, even top ten, sneaking in that top ten. I was when I was looking at the roster. What's y'all's opinion on Kadarius Tony, bro? I love him. I love him. I love him a lot. I mean, rookie I think of the year? Bring, nah, I don't think he'll win rookie of the year. But I think he'll bring a lot to this Giants offense, just with his ver- position versatility and his explosive play potential. This is a guy that you can just put the ball in his hands and tell him to go. Like, uh, like that was the scrimmage. What'd you say? I, I, I can say it. I, I don't know if rookie in the year is possible. I, I got to look at – I think Trevor Lawrence had that locked up, basically. But uh, that's the yards from scrimmage, rushing and – rushing and passing, rushing and receiving, not, not, out of, not out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, but I think it will also be hard for him to get a whole lot of opportunities, especially when talking about that 1,000-yard category, because you just got to look at all the weapons that the Giants have now. You've got Saquon coming back, and we know he's a workhorse back. You got two guys on the slot in Darius Slade and Sterling Shepard already, who I think have pretty much established themselves in the league. And now you throw Kenny Galladay out there on the uh, perimeter. And I think Tony's going to make some plays, but I just feel like his opportunities are going to be limited when it, when it comes to, you know, like rookie of the year status and uh, end of the year awards. But I think he'll be a key piece of Jason Garrett's offense this season. In terms of offensive uh, weapons, who do you think is the second best in the NFC East? We all know Dallas is the first. Besides, unless you don't think Dallas is the first, who do y'all think is the second best uh, offensive weapons in the NFC East? In total? Washington. Washington. Offensive weapons? I would, no. I would say, I would probably go with New York. Giants. Let me give that. So I'll, I'll go with the Giants. You know, you, get, you, you have a you have a, a undisputed number one receiver and then they all pro back. You know, I don't think any other team in the division can say that. 
besides Dallas? I mean, I think if you look at Washington, there's a lot of talent on that team that people aren't talking about. You got a thousand yard receiver in Terry McLaurin. You got a guy in Curtis Samuel, who's a legit thousand yards from scrimmage kind of guy, both receiving and rushing. We saw some of that in Carolina. And now he's hooking up with his old offensive coordinator in Scott Turner in Washington. So I think the opportunities are limitless there. And like I said, you got the two backs, and then you got uh, the tight end. I can't remember his name, who came on last year. Uh, but Logan, Logan Thomas. Thomas. He's Logan Thomas. He's turned into a dynamic tight end. And then you add to that room, dynamic Thomas as a wide receiver. I think that Washington offense has a lot of weapons that they can throw at you, and it will make Ryan Fitzpatrick's job as a quarterback ten times easier. Mm-hmm. It is. I, 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 I was looking more – we'll get back into it a little later, but I, look, I would look at Washington's defensive side, and I kind of feel how you feel about their offensive weapons, you know. But, you know, end of the day, I think that you can't question that they, the New York has the best back in the league, has, has the best back in the division. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, you know, they already had a solid foundation with uh, Slade, with Shepard. And throw Gala into the mix, throw Kandarius Tony into the mix. I think you take them from a a – average to above average offense to a team that you can legitimately look and you have playmakers all over the field, which is probably the next step for Washington. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, last topic about the Giants before we move on to Washington, how much faith do you guys have in the Giants defense that they can be relied upon again to win games like they did week 13 in Seattle? How much faith do you got in this unit? Um... Again, you know, I am. I'm always going to go back to the pass rush. You know, you got Leonard Williams in there, the left game green, 11 and a half sacks this year, creating interior pressure. You got a lot of, you know, quick twitch guys that can, can that have the potential to break out. Lorenzo Carter is a guy out of Georgia that four and a half sacks last year, super athletic, super, you know, dynamic. You know, he has no, nowhere to grow but up. You know, even, you know, a guy like Aziz, Aziz Ojalar, a guy that they, they kind of failed in him in the second round out of Georgia. You know, two athletic. Super pass rushes from Georgia, you know, even if they're not the most refined guys, they're going to be able to, you know, scare teams with their athleticism. And they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to speed rush their way in the five sacks. So, then you got a Dory Jackson out there out beside um, – who's the number one corner? Uh, James Bradbury. Yeah. All, the number guys, seventh ranked you know, corner by PFF. Yeah. And I guess I don't know how <laughs> – I don't know how fans Vance feels about Adore Jackson, but I think that he that's the perfect compliment to you know Brad, <laughs> uh, a speedier guy, somebody <laughs> somebody that can you know ha- that doesn't have to handle or handle or re- wide receiver one responsibilities that can go in the slot, can't go outside, you know, and makes makes honestly Brad Berry's job a little bit easier, and maybe he can take that next step from Pro Bowler to All Pro, just you know having somebody outside, having a legitimate you know number one corner next out or opposite of him. Man, I, I actually think the, the Giants uh, defense is right there with Washington football team. I know, I, as you said, the only question that I have with their defense is uh, a Dory Jackson. You know, um, there's a reason why the, the Tennessee Titans released him. I, I you know, I, I'm a Titans fan. I watch a lot of their games. Uh, what I saw was he would just let the receiver catch the ball, then he would tackle him. But, you know, with having the type of front seven that you have, the pass rush that you have with the Giants, you, you don't even have to give them time to uh, get open, bro. You can press them, and that's going to give you a chance to get a lot of picks. Now, that's one thing Adore is good at. So this honestly might be the perfect fit for him. You got the front seven. You got Leonard Williams, Danny Shelton, Dexter Lawrence, Lorenzo Carter, Blake Martinez. That's a lot of name-brand guys that you had to rush the passer. Just like Josh said, it's going to be it's gonna be spooky. I think they're going to be almost as good as Washington football team defense. And just one more thing on Adore Jackson. I think him coming into a situation where he will always guard the number two guy is going to do miracles for him. Because in Tennessee, he was guarding the number two in Tennessee. No, because Malcolm, Malcolm Butler, Butler was number one. But he wasn't a traveler, though. James Bradbury is one of two corners to play 350 mm, okay, plus snaps okay. on each side of the field. So wherever that it. number one guy is going, that's where James Bradbury is going. He's not staying on one side of the field. So I think by traveling, I think Adore can make his situation better and find easier matchups for him. You know, all of that goes back to game planning, too, and things like that. But I think, like, with the scheme that Patrick Graham has for that defense in uh, New York, I think things could be scary for the rest of the NFC East uh, when they play the Giants. Oh, I, I, I do, too. Like I, I picked them as a surprise team. 
I will pump the brakes on them, you know, compare them to not comparing them, but uh, saying that they're they're good, they're as good as Washington defense. You know, I, I would have I have a, a few concerns about them being able to hold up front, especially losing uh, losing Dalvin Tomlinson. You know, you got Dexter Lawrence there, but in terms of just D D line play, I, you know, outside of uh, outside of Leonard Williams, there are some questions that I have about generating consistent, you know, pass rush and then, mm-hmm. you know being able to hold them on first and second down. But if we were, in terms of relying upon them to win games, they did it last year. You know, they brought they they didn't really lose anybody serious outside of Tomlinson. They brought in Adore Jackson. You know, they, they had brought in Danny Shelton too to fill that hole in the middle. Yeah, but he's off, he's hurt a lot, and there's a reason why Cleveland gave him up so easily. But again, he's a good option to have if he can stay healthy. So I think they can. You know, I don't. I think the Giants' offense will take a step forward, and that'll help the defense even more, just keeping them off the field and allowing them to you know create plays, create turnovers like they they were really good at last year. And now we're on to the Washington football team, the team that still doesn't have a name, man. So last year, they won the division with a whopping record of 7-9. and nine. So looking at this team, man, and how they found success in winning the division, the key to success for them was their defense. The fourth best defense in points allowed, only allowing 20 points per game. The, the defense was second in yards allowed, only allowing 304. And second in pass yards allowed, only allowing 191 passing yards per game. And they did all of this without any big names in the secondary. Instead, they relied heavily on the front headed by Chase Young, Montez Sweat, Montez Sweat, Darren Payne, Jonathan Allen, and Ryan Carey. And now the offense, of course, wasn't on the level of the defense. They started three different quarterbacks throughout the regular season, looking at Dwayne Haskins, Kyle Allen, and Alex Smith, who made a miraculous comeback. And then in the wild card game, of course, they started another quarterback in Taylor Heineke, who actually pushed Tampa Bay to the limit as they lost eventually 23-31. to 31. So last year was Ron Rivera's first year in Washington, and he really stabilized that franchise after all the madness and, you know, uproar in the offseason. And he had been playing some pretty good football. So looking at last year, coming into this year, how you guys feel about this Washington team? Um, Pretty good. You know, like you said, the 7-9 the record was pretty <laughs> embarrassing and a, kind of a line of demarcation on the whole division. But, you know, you know what type of guy I am. That that defensive line really excited me. And they're all, they're all you know, under 26, 27. You know, Washington has heavily invested in, you know, their front four play. But Chase Young, like you said, Montez Sweat, guys that are going to be able to, you know, for me, the game starts in the, on, you know, on the offensive defensive lines. And for them to have, you know, I think it's arguably the best defensive line in the NFL right now, just bowls well for them and continue, bowls well for them. And the fact that they're all young guys, I think I see continued success for them. You know, and then like you told, you touched on recently, the, the offense developing. You know, Taylor Heineke, you know, had a really good game in the playoff versus uh, Tampa Bay. And, you know, there's been a, a, some some things coming out of the training camp, how, how he struggled against the defense so far. But I think it would be worth it giving him at least some sort of shot, you know, in the regular season, especially we know about the, the ups and downs of Ryan Fitzpatrick. But um, I can go out and let me say this will be the first – I would believe this will be the first time since uh, the Donovan McNabb Eagles that the NFC East will have a, a, a repeat uh, champion and then the Washington football team. Almost said the almost said all. <laughs> That's not a hot take. Uh, you know, that on paper, they do kind of look like the best team, especially on defense. Have a top three defense in the NFL, you know, right there with Chicago and Tampa Bay. Pick your poison on who you want. Uh, bonafide best defensive line in the NFL, like both of y'all said, uh, Jonathan Allen, Chase Young, Montez Sweat. Uh, Nick, you said that Darren Payne. I, I call him Deron Payne. It just sounds tougher, bro. You got uh, John Bostic at, at linebacker, William J- uh, Jackson at corner, uh, Landon Collins. It's just, you know, name brand guys at uh, all three levels, bro. And, um, you know, that that's four first round picks on the defensive line. Uh, you That's the same where you improve on what you do good at instead of spending time trying to get better at what you're not in the NFL. That's the best way. Um, to get better in the NFL. Uh, the only question is the quarterback play. You, like uh, like you said, Josh, you got Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, I believe he's going to start off hot, but he's going to cool down as the season progresses. That's just like the type of quarterback he's been throughout his career. Um, he'll be an upgrade from Alex Smith in terms of downfield passing game, but uh, he'll become more predictable with game film. But I, I do think they're going to be right there and they're running for first place in the NFC East. 
Yeah, go on with what you said, Vance. I would just kind of say that you know the the they are in terms of you know importance. They're struggling. They they have question marks at two of the worst positions to have you know question marks at, which is you know, important in O line. But you know, like Nick touched on, they have pieces in place. You know, they have you know serious offensive weapons to deal with. So whatever whoever is going to be behind the center, whoever's going to be you know whoever they're going to be protecting them, they're not going to have to work so hard. You got Terry Mulholland that has come out as a legitimate number one. You got our guy Antonio Gibson that you know came on a, a thousand yard rusher towards the end of the season. You know uh, J.D. McKissick got a you know a change of pace back. You know can you know do things out of the backfield in terms of on the ground and in the receiving game. So and then you got like I said Logan Thomas, a guy that can stretch the field you know in the middle of the seams and be a red zone threat. So I think that I was still I, I don't like that they have questions at those the two of the most important position groups in the on the team, but they have you know they have the most talent everywhere else, and I don't think that's inarguable. And I think that with the weapons they got, you know, the success that they had last year, and they got guys, you know, a, a Fitzpatrick that is a, a stopgap guy, you know, somebody that, that can come in and has been proven to be able to have some good football and make some good throws, at least for <laughs> half of a season, you know, just to, to be sustainable. I think that, you know, th- this team can make a serious jump, you know, depending on about the, the quarterback play and what offensive line development they have this season. Yeah, I, I will say that this Washington team has invested in that O-line this offseason. Bringing in left guard Eric Flowers from Miami and bringing in left tackle Charles Leno from Chicago. In addition to Brandon Scherf, who they already have, and who's one of the better young guards in this league. So I think they've really shored up that offensive line. They drafted uh, Sam Cosmo out of Texas. Yeah, exactly. Drafted him too. So I think they put a lot of investment into that offensive line. So I would say the weakest part of this team is that quarterback position. But I will say, that with Fitzpatrick scheduled to be the starter, Heineke scheduled to be the backup right now, and Kyle Allen still working his way back from that ankle injury last season, this team kind of reminds me a lot of that Broncos Super Bowl team that beat the Mm. Panthers. A great defense, an aging quarterback who's smart. Don't forget, Ryan Fitzpatrick graduated from Harvard. The Harvard guy. Real smart, real cerebral guy. And I think that relying on the running game Kind of similar to how the uh, Broncos relied on, who was it, Noshawn Moreno? Yes. On their Super Bowl run. You got two guys in Washington looking at Antonio Gibson and, uh, like you said, J.D. JD McKissick. And also, you can also throw Curtis Samuel into that mix. A three-headed attack at running back, guys that not only run the ball, but rack up a lot of receptions as well. So I think, like, just looking at this Broncos team, I think they can rely on that defense throughout the year. You got to look, just look at the wild card game against Tampa Bay, bro. They held well, Tampa Bay to 31 points and they put up 23 themselves. When your offense doesn't have to make 80, 90, 70 yard drives all game, offensive football becomes a lot easier. It becomes easier to put points on the board. And that's what Washington prides itself on doing creating short field position for that offense, allowing that offense to capitalize on those moments and just playing good, solid defense. So I think it's possible that this team finds a lot of success this year. It wouldn't surprise me if they were first in the uh, NFC East this year. I don't really expect it, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did that. And it wouldn't even surprise me if they made a run in the playoffs, in all honesty. The only – the biggest barrier I see with them, you know, we, I know we didn't go bit too deep into, you know, records and in-game analysis, every game-by-game analysis, but just listen to the, team, the quarterbacks they had to play. You, got, you play Tampa Bay – play Green Bay, you play Kansas City at home, and then you play, you go away and play, you have a, you have a home at home with Buffalo. So those are the four elite quarterbacks that you had to play, you know, Josh Allen, you know, uh, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, and Pat Mahomes to where, you know, regardless of how well you scheme up, how well you game plan against there, there are going to be certain outlier throws and and certain things that they're going to make that you simply can't game plan against that they're going to have you have your DC pulling out your hair. So honestly for them, I think that's the only the biggest barrier they have in terms of getting ten wins and and um winning just cruising to the division title outright. You know, as the division as as the division winner, they're gonna have the toughest schedule. But I mean, the, the week twelve to seventeen where they get Philadelphia, they get uh, Dallas twice. That will be the biggest determinant. They can they'll need to go at least four and one or five. You know, win out those last five games just to secure that uh secure that division title. Yeah, well, I will say you talk about the elite quarterbacks they play. The best way to stop an elite quarterback is with an elite pass rush. We saw it happen to Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl. That Tampa Bay pass rush ate him up. 
And yes, the Chiefs were missing two of their starting tackles, and yes, that's going to hurt any team. But a pass rush like Tampa Bay's doing what it did to Patrick Mahomes, that, that's the formula right there. The formula is that a good pass rush can beat a good quarterback any given Sunday. And like I said, any given Sunday, anything can happen. Ryan Fitzpatrick plays a above average game. Your defense does what it has to do. This is a team that can win a game any Sunday. Well, I like I like what you said in turn about, you know, why the Patrick having to play. I think that would have to be the case, you know, in those four games. And then they play like a, they play, they go to mile high and play a dub, a tough Denver team, which actually kind of has a similar makeup as them in terms of having an elite defense with a, a shaky quarterback situation. So then that's a game to where, you know, you will have you will need some uh, some outlier performances from Ryan Fitzpatrick or whoever makes it to the whoever was starting for Washington at that time. You know. And that's something that, you know, they can't really control. They, that's the schedule that they were given, you know, one of the toughest schedules in the, in the, in the NFL. But, you know, that's your reward for winning the conference last year or winning the division last year. So, you know, that, that would be the, the key for their season, obviously. We've talked in and around it all year. But what kind of quarterback performance can you get? How consistent can Ryan Fitzpatrick or Taylor Heineken, whoever you bring in to play, you know, how well above their head can they play for so long? And so – now we're going to move on to the last team in the division, the team with the best quarterback in the division, and the team with the most controlling owner in the division. So that would be the Dallas Cowboys, the team that went 6-10 and 10 last year after losing uh, Dak Prescott in week, what was it, week six. And so this offense, it took a huge step back last year. Like I said, uh, Dak Prescott was injured for the majority of the year with that compound fracture. You got very little out of Ezekiel Elliott last year. Rushed for less than a uh, a thousand yards and also lost four fumbles. Had a career low in yards per attempt too. And but even though you got very little from Zeke, you got a lot from the receiving combination of Amari Cooper and C. D. Lamb, two guys that combined for over two thousand yards and ten touchdowns. And also, similar to the Eagles, the uh, Cowboys faced a number of injuries along their offensive line. Tyron Smith only played two games. Lyle Collins missed the entire season. And Zach Martin was in and out of that uh, lineup. And Travis Frederick retired before the start of the season. But even though you lost Dak, that wasn't Dallas's biggest problem. Their biggest it problem hurts. was that very, very sad defense, bro. I'm just going to put it like this, bro. They gave up a franchise record 473 points last year, man. 473 like points across 16 games, bro. That's terrible, bro. In the first six weeks alone, the teams put up 20, 39, 38, 49, 34, and 38 points on the Cowboys, leading them to starting two and four. So looking at the team, day. exactly, yeah. exactly. That went down in week five. So looking at this team, man, how do y'all feel about them coming into 2020, 2021? Um, you know, like again, starting off with the Hall of Models, you definitely you, you're bringing back three guys that will help keep Dak upright. You know, Lyle Collins, Zach Martin. A time on Smith guys that were out essentially missed all of last season. You know, getting that offensive line continuity, being able to you know get Zeke to back where he was at. You know, the fumbling was still, I think, would continue to happen. But with him coming in, like he said, the, the best shape of his life, the revitalizing, and the having the, the all the, the whole team coming in with a, a bad taste in the mouth. I definitely think that they're they're due for some bounce back season. But you know, again, we you talked about it, Nick. Me and Vance were defensive guys. I don't think that the moves they made this on the in free agency or in the draft was, are, are going to be enough to really just give that that uh that defense any type of juice. It essentially, be kind of the same things that they had they had last year before they got hurt. You know, a lot of thirty-five to forty-point shootouts, and you know, I love CD Lamb, Michael Gallup, all that, but that's not. I don't think that's going to be a, a sustainable way to play. You know, you bring in a uh, Counter Neal, you bring in Malik Cooker, you know, a couple guys that can shore up the, the back half a little bit. But again, you know, the front seven, you know, Jalen. You know, one of the guys that Vance loves to talk about is a guy that allow a 10-yard catch and tackle him, you know, 11 yards down the field. Late Jalen Vander- Smith. I said Jalen Brown, didn't I? I'm thinking about the, uh, thinking about the Celtics. Uh, Late Vanderich, somebody that, you know, has struggled to stay on the field. 
Um, I don't think it's gonna. Michael Parsons is was a guy I love, and I think he can, he can do some real damage you know, either off the edge or in the middle of that that uh that Cowboys defense. But I don't think that you should be you know entrusting a rookie to be your defensive leader day one. You know, he could turn into Ray. Lewis. I I I would bet against it. You know, crazy things have happened, but for him to have to step in and to essentially be Dallas's best defensive player day one, that's something that um I, that's not gonna really sit well with me. I don't think that defense takes any step forward. You know, Demarcus Lawrence, you know, he got his big payday. He's just been underperforming. So, you know, then, like I said, that, that defensive line, that front seven will continue to struggle unless, you know, Jalen Smith and Leighton Bender has really regained their, their, their Pro Bowl form that they got to, which I don't really see happening. Yeah. Vance, what um, do you think about your team's defense? About the defense? I think it got a lot better. I mean, in terms of – I feel as if the – it did get a lot – it got a lot better at the, in the, at the second half of last season. Like, you know, as you said, Nick, you know, the first couple of games, it was ugly. But as um, the team got more experience, uh, they got better, especially on defense. You had uh, Neville Gallimore. He was playing uh, better last season. He was a rookie. This year he's a second-year pro. He was Demarcus Lawrence towards the end of the season. He got better and better. You know, get the football legs um, in shape. Randy Gregory, I, I'm expecting a Pro Bowl season out of Randy. I can't. I, I'm thinking 10 plus sacks. You got uh, Micah Parsons, you know, a rookie this year. Trevon Diggs, second, like I said, second half of the season, he was probably one of the better lockdown corners in a uh, in the NFL. Yeah. The way he was playing. Now the big question is going to be Jalen Smith and later Van Ish, bro. You know, both when they played their rookie seasons, they look like world beaters. Like they was going to be all pro Brian Erlacher type of careers. You know, they both had slumpy sophomore seasons, and then um, the third or fourth seasons weren't as good either. So for those two, I think they're going to be the key on defense. Yeah. Um, offense, best passing offense in the NFL. I said it better than the Chiefs, better than the Bucks, better than the Packers, better than whoever you want them to be better than. It, it's just a fact. Dad Prescott is going to put up with the points, the yards, the stats, you know, fantasy, fantasy legends, fantasy football legends. Uh, C.D. Lamb, I'm expecting him to be a top 10 receiver. That, I'm expecting that. Uh, last yeah. season, just as a rookie, and you know he didn't have half the season with Dak. He had 877 receiving yards from the slot. That was the second most behind Cole Beasley. And uh, I, I'm expecting big things from the Cowboys. Just looking at everything. I don't think yeah. me and Nick are going to go debate you about the the value of the Cowboys offense. I, I don't think that them being a, a top five offense is you know out of the realm of possibility. Even something that will be up for debate. But you know, going back to it, you know, I like I like Diggs a lot. His second year, he I think he's gonna establish himself as a number one corner this year. But you know, you talking about you know, depending on ten sacks from Randy Gregory, you know, depending on uh, the bounce back from from Jalen Smith and Leighton Vander Esch, it's kind of the same narrative that we've been we've been talking. Oh, about. I'm not dependent on that. Come on, come on, relax about the linebackers. Randy Gregory, I'm expecting ten sacks. I said question marks are Van Vander Esch and Jalen Smith. Do not put that in my mouth. <laughs> I mean, even if you if you're trying to expect ten sacks from Randy Gregory, you could have just kept Alden Smith in terms of guys trouble pass rushers. I mean, it is what it is. We've been waiting on Randy Gregory to break out since he came out of Nebraska. All right, so, bro. Is this this is the season? Okay, it's, it was the season last year. And the year, but, no, you know. it's this one. It's this one. I'm telling you. Okay, sounds good, man. But <laughs> regardless of how you think, I think that you know you bring in a Terrell Basham, which I've seen him have, have mediocre pass rush for the Jets. You bring in a, a guy Keanu Neal that. <laughs> Gonna play in the box. He may help y'all's linebacker court more than anything else because he's not gonna be able to have a deep half and cover in the way you want a traditional safety to do. So I, I don't. A lot of the same things. You'll have Dak Prescott back there instead of Andy Dalton, and that'll make you, you know, infinitely more confident. But you know, the the, the play style and the way that the, the y'all game will go will be very similar. It'll be a lot of forty-five to forty-two. It'll be a lot of thirty-eight to thirty-five because I just, that defense, you know. They did not do what they had to do in terms of you know making the defense, the making the strides and making the additions that they needed to in the offseason. Well, I will say last year this defense was polarizing. They were bad, don't get me wrong, but they were polarizing, bro. They were tenth worst in yards per game, allowing over three hundred eighty yards. Seventh worst in points allowed, allowing about thirty points per game. But they were top ten in turnovers, forcing twenty three. So if this defense can be stingy and take the ball away. I think this off. I think the Cowboys as a whole will be a much better team. And then you look on offense. Zeke had a career low in yards per attempt, and it was also his. It was the second lowest number of carries in his career. The lowest number of carries came in 2017 
when he had 242 carries in 10 games. This gotta get TP the ball, though. Gotta get, gotta get Tony Pollard the ball. But like I was saying, Zeke had 242 carries in 2017 over 10 games. This past season, he had 244 carries over 15. Mm. You got to give Zeke the ball more, man. And I think Thanks. running the ball, keeping the defense off the field, combined with Dax prowess with, with that passing game, I think that alone makes the Cowboys a much better team. If they continue to take the ball away and they use Zeke more in that offense to run the ball, I think this Cowboys team could be uh, even better, especially with new defensive coordinator Dan Quinn and just by playing compl- more complimentary football. Hey, to, to be fair for Zeke, bro, when was the last time you saw him finish a run? Maybe 2018? So you like, these last two years have been pretty trash from Zeke. And like, as a Cowboys fan, this is just what I see. He doesn't finish runs. Like he used to, he used to score 50, 40 yard touchdowns. I don't remember the last time he scored a touchdown outside the red zone. I really don't. I like nothing's coming to mind. I, 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 I'll look it up and I'll apologize to him on Twitter if I do see a touchdown outside the red zone. But he needs to start finishing runs more. Yeah. Instead of his running out of bounds. Run, his longest rush in 2020 was 31 yards. His longest rush in 2019 was 33. Yeah, come on. The longest rush was 41. That's that, that probably was the last time he had a 41 yard touchdown, that 41 yard rush. Yeah. Like, come on, bro. That's that's sad. You know, it is what it is. Uh yes, I'm No, team. it's not. We do you know how much we pay in this man? <laughs> I mean, he, he had three of his best offensive linemen that were down. I was I would yeah. contribute to more than anything else, you know, especially yeah. Thomas Smith and uh Lyle Collins. You know, he, he just gotta get in shape. Apparently, that's what he did. Shaping so, opportunities, man. That's yeah. the biggest thing. I just want to close the Cowboys segment out with this. The Cowboys will have a top blank offense this season. Top, top five. I, I, I don't think that'll prevent them from going uh, seven, seven and ten, but they'll have a top five offense for sure. A top two and not two offense in the NFL. Ooh. Ooh. It, it's gonna, I mean, just y'all saying we're going to be giving up all these points, bro. Stats gonna be skewed if we gonna be losing like seven. If we gonna go seven and ten, we gonna have to pass the ball, get the stats up. And then we talked about you know CD Lamb. You know we just talked about uh with Jalen Smith and Lane Benders. It it would not be irreasonable to take for him to think have some sort of sophomore slump himself. So that's just something some some food for thought for you, Vance. For you, you, you declared him better than the Kansas City or the Tampa Bay's offense. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't exactly expect to take you know uh, offense that was really good last year. Just t- expect them to take that next step. You know, it ain't no step it. they gotta take. They was top five last year before that guy hurt. Well, you don't. You do your best to make sure they don't take a step back. Then. How about that? All right, they won't. It's the only. The defense is the only question mark. Okay, but you know, talking about, I mean, so if they offer you a contract right now to come play D line, you playing? No, I got one shoulder, a torn labral. You might leave. You might, you might. leave the Cowboys and Saints right now. No cap. You can. Mm, you know they didn't put me. I'm, I'm an officer guy, bro. Like, like Anton Woods, like bro. <laughs> they, they don't. They don't got that much juice up front. You could get you a. You could get yeah, you bro. on three tick right now. Yeah, you might be. The, probably, you might be the best one out. I'm there. more of an inspirational speaker, bro. <laughs> <laughs> this nigga. This nigga. At this down. point <laughs> in my life. <laughs> okay, that's how you but um. Let me throw let me throw a verse at you. One of the, our, our our favorite segments to do just talking about some of the quarterbacks that we we discussed in the NFC so far. I'm gonna do a little throwback. So I'm gonna look at their last season in college just to see you know how they progressed, you know, the different expectations they had coming to the, the uh, coming to the NFL, and where you would compare each of them you know so far. So for player A, um, got for his last year in school, 69.7 of uh, completion percentage, 3,851 yards. 32 tutties, eight interceptions, second in the Heisman voting, and a 196.7 passer efficiency rating. Player B, his last year in school, uh, 67.2 completion percentage, 3,273 yards, 41 tutties, three interceptions, third place Heisman voting finish, and a, a 181.4 player efficiency rating. Player C, you got his last year, 66.2 
completion percentage, 3,793 yards, 29 touchdowns, five picks, um, eight in the Heisman voting the year before, and a 151 player efficiency rating. So, on the top of the dome, as the young folks say. Yeah, just off that, I got a rock with player B, man. 41 tutties to only three picks and a 181 rating, bro. Can't go wrong with that. And above a 65% accuracy. I, I like the way player B is looking, man. Okay. Who, who would you take, man? Mm, give me give me player A. I'm going to take the passion efficiency rating. And then, um, you know, I, player B stats might be skewed. It's not like he played in a lot of blowouts for it to be something like that. Give me mm. player A. Okay. So let me read out. Let me, let me, this, is, this will be funny for you, Vance. Play A is uh, Jalen Hurst, his last season in Oklahoma. You know, <laughs> talked about, you know, the different scheme going from Alabama to uh, Oklahoma, going from Alabama to Oklahoma. Kind of actually what you said about player B, skew stats, you know, the offense, Lincoln Riley offense, things like that. Player B, Justin Fields, his last year at Oklahoma, his, 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 I put his, his full year at uh, Ohio State, so 2019. I just did a little okay, bit. Okay, okay, okay. Just because COVID year is, it is what it is. Player C, 2015, 2014 Heisman candidate, Dak Prescott. So, you know, that was his, that was the year that they uh they Mississippi State, they was they ended up being one or two in the AP poll, things like that. Yeah. You know, that just that magical year, beat old Miss and Egg Ball, all that stuff. So, considering the fact that neither one of y'all chose what I think what I would consider the best quarterback, best professional quarterback at this point right now, where do you project hurt? Where do you project, where do each of y'all project hurts and feels in comparison to Dak Prescott? And do you think they could end up but either one of them could be end up being better than him? I mean, those stats were the reason why uh, Dan Prescott went in the fourth round and not in the first or second or even the third. Uh, I feel as if Jalen Hurts, he, you got to have the right system around him. Right now, the Eagles, as constructed, he's going to do the best he can. I think he's solid, but is he like, can he be a top tier quarterback? I think he can. I just don't think he will just because of the pieces around him. Then you have uh, Justin Fields. I think he's the true. I wasn't sold on him at Ohio State until this past season, honestly. And all the things he's done, it's just I don't trust Ohio State quarterbacks, but I think he's finally going to break that curse. Mm. Why are you, Nick? Uh, I think Dak Prescott set the bar for overachieving in terms of draft position. Fourth round pick to uh, offensive rookie of the year. Uh, was on pace to break pain managed passing yard record before he got injured this year. He's kind of set the bar for overachievement as a quarterback. But I feel like Justin Fields and Jalen Hurts came in with a higher pedigree than that. And I feel like if anybody was to surpass that in terms of being a better quarterback, I'd have to put my money on Justin Fields. Mm-hmm. I just – he's impressed in camp so far. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of high praise going towards him. And you just look at his career from high school to now. He's always been number two. To Trevor Lawrence. He fell to number four behind Trevor Lawrence in the draft. It was Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, and then he came off the board. So I think he's coming into the league with a chip on his shoulder and he has something to prove. And I think Justin Fields is the kind of guy that's going to prove what he seeks out to prove. He's got every skill you need, looking at accuracy, athleticism, touch. I think he's going to be that guy in Chicago sooner rather than later. But to close this little preview out, man, we're going to rank these four teams in the division in terms of how we see them finishing the year. What team will have the best record? What team will have the worst record? So I'm going to start out, man. At the end of the year, I hate this. It's a tough one, bro, but I'll say the Cowboys offense are going to lead them to winning the division with Washington coming in at second, the Giants coming in at third, and the Eagles being dead last in this division, man. Mm. I like it. I like it. You know, I I don't like it. I just said it just because you know my, you my friend. I like to spread your feelings. <laughs> but I actually kind of hated it. You know, you no, know, I I don't believe. You know, just like in basketball, I don't really believe in you know high scoring teams that don't play no defense. And I, I kind of say the same velocity in football. You know, so I'm I'm gonna take Washington. I'll take New York. I'll take Dallas, and then I you know, Philadelphia would you know get touched in there last. You no, know, they're my sleeper pick, man. I think Daniel Jones is, is kind of due for a big step back. You know, I think Saquon if he can stay on the field for 17 games. 2,000 yards, and just with an extra game, you know, with the offense weapons that he got. Um, and I think he'll be significantly better than Zeke, in, you know, in the, this year. So as much as I like how Dallas offense will look, how pretty it will be, I don't think it will lead to that much substance. And I think that down the stretch, when they have that, that, those week 12 to 17 games, or well, week 12 to 18 games, 
when it will be the deciding factor. I think the the Giants will you know beat Dallas two out of three and end up you know second in the division over there. Before I, before I give my prediction, I, I want to do a start one, bench one, cut one. Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley, and Antonio Gibson. I'll go first, bro. You know, hey, me, babies. Yeah. Uh, let me this go, Nick, because I got, I got my – I got yeah, my. you got it. You got it. I'll go uh, start Saquon, bench AG, and then cut Zeke because he's going to fumble the ball. Neither one of the guys fumble that much. So, hey, I don't – yeah, never mind. I'm going to say something that would have got us canceled. What's that? Yeah. Uh, for me, I got to cut AD. Uh, he's young in the league. But I can see him doing big things. Got to start Saquon. Got to bench Zeke. I think <laughs> last year will be an anomaly for Zeke. Uh, like like I mentioned before, he had his second lowest number of carries, uh, lowest yards in the 10th battle line. I think – I really think Zeke bounces back this year. It shows us who he was his rookie year, his first three years in the league. So that's what I got to say about Zeke. Saquon tans down one of the top three backs in the league when he's healthy. So I got to start him, man. All right, bro. I'll let y'all have that. Whatever. Eagles, I got them in number four in the division. Number three, I'm going to go with the New York football Giants, nine and eight. Eagles, I had them in three and uh, 14, not 13, three and 14. Giants, nine and eight. Washington football team in second place at 11 and six. And I got the Dallas Cowboys going 12 and five. And I, I'm not even, I don't, you know what? The Cowboys aren't even the best team in the division. I just think their schedule is set up for them to win 12 games. Hey, man, I'm looking for my lighter. I got you in a minute, bro. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what you want. I ain't trying I to a, hear it, bro. Yeah, I got a lighter. Right go, go look at the Cowboys schedule when you get a chance, bro. It's a lot of doves in the beginning of the season. I think I, I look, I, but, bro, I'm telling you, I, Washington defense, you know, the weapons they got, you know, you know, Dak Prescott, he's he's a a a all pro level quarterback. But I think the 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 massive upgrade with Washington defense, even with New York's defense, I think that that will be able to carry them. And I think that if it comes down to it, like I said, in those week those week 12, week 14, 18 games, that last stretch of the the the, the, the season, I think I would take Washington in uh in New York over y'all. So I'll put y'all third in the division. All right. And so there y'all have it. That's how we think the NFC East is going to go down, man. It's going to be a good year in the NFL, man. 17 games, plenty of action. And so with that, man, make sure y'all stay tuned for all of our other division predictions and just keep rocking with us, man. Make sure y'all like, comment, subscribe, and we out of here. All that, all that, all that.